This week on the show, we cover the Emulex, the cheapest 10 gigabyte ethernet for your home lab. We have an article about the search of 2.11 BSD from Warlosh as uh, has been released. The fake cracker NetBSD as a function-based micro VM is what we cover, which is an interesting concept. The first PowerPC 64 snapshots are available for OpenBSD. The OpenSense 2.01 release is available and many more interesting things in this week's episode of BSD now. ESD Now, episode 361, function-based micro-VM, recorded for the 29th of July, 2020. This episode of BSD Now is brought to you by Tarsnap, the online backup for the truly paranoid. Hi, I'm your host, Benedikt Reuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. Welcome to this week's episode, everyone. Hope you had a nice time up to this episode, because no week is perfect without listening to BSD Now, I would say. Uh, but that's up to you. Uh, we have a nice headline this week. Uh, Emulex, the cheapest 10 gigabyte Ethernet for your home lab. Yep. Uh, so this goes, years ago, the hunt for the cheapest 10 gigabit uh, NICs resulted in buying the Mellanox ConnectX 2, uh, single or dual port 10 gigabit network cards, uh, from eBay, usually in the ten to fifteen dollar range. Nowadays, these cards have increased in cost to twenty to thirty dollars. While still cheap, uh, they're not quite the cheapest anymore, and there are some alternatives. Also, with the Mellanox, you have to watch out that you don't get the InfiniBand cards, which is not Ethernet. Uh, although some of them can do Ethernet and things, of it, but you generally don't want that. Mm. I've got very lucky and got quite a few of the Mellanox ConnectX2 dual port. Or are they? Maybe. Single, mostly single port, I think. 10 gigabit cards for that, that price. And some that I bought even included the, the DAC, the, the cable that, to connect it to the switch, which greatly increases the value. So uh, he says, before diving into details, let's get something pretty clear. If you want the absolute simplest plug and play 10 gigabit LAN for your home lab, just pay the extra for the Mellanox. Uh, but if you're willing to go hands on and do some manual configuration and installation and, and faffing about, then the Emulex 10 gigabit NICs can be had uh, quite cheaply. The Emulex NICs can be had for about $10 to $15 on eBay, uh, sometimes even cheaper. I recently picked up a set of four cards, uh, which came bundled with six SFP plus 10 gig short range modules for a total of $47.48. Considering I can usually find the SFP modules for about $5 each, those alone are 30 of the $48. So he has some particular model numbers you can look for, like the Emulex OCE 1010 or 1110 uh, some HP or Intel, or sorry, HP or IBM branded versions that are basically the same card, but you know, because they came out of, because they have the IBM badging on them, you'll need to search for this different model number to find them. For FreeNAS, uh, if you're using FreeBSD or FreeNAS 11.3, that's the earliest that these cards tend to work on, and uh, FreeNAS had the driver backported. But uh, FreeBSD 12.1 includes the driver, uh, and so you just have to put if underscore OCE underscore load equals yes in your loader.conf, and then it will start working. If you have older versions, then it gets a little bit more complicated, and then I have some notes on that in the uh, blog post here. It looks like uh, FreeBSD 11.3 and possibly 11.4, which is new, have a broken version of the OCE driver where some cards will work, but some cards will cause a kernel panic during initialization. There's apparently some tuning and compiling you can do to fix the problem. But uh, yeah, if you wanna use these cheaper cards, uh, there are instructions on how to work around a couple of uh, caveats that happen to pop up there. Okay, so it's not unfixable. Mm -hmm. I've also found cheap uh, solar flare 10 gigabit cards on eBay. I have a couple of those. They actually work out of the box more because the driver is built into FreeBSD and you don't even have to manually load it, but they do have some other problems. They don't do the multi-queue stuff as nicely, so they don't spread the load out across CPUs as nice and they are optimized for low latency so these are you know uh most of these cards were specifically built for high frequency trading and and hpc and things like that and so they focus on getting the packet through as quickly as possible rather than as as much traffic as possible so in mine i found that they tend to top out around eight and a bit gigabits per second instead of the full 10 that i get with 
the Mellanox or uh, my Chelsea 10 gigabit NICs. But if they're cheap, they generally work quite well and are worth picking up. The other thing I would note is if you are going to do this at home, sometimes a DAC is a better solution. While you can usually get the optics relatively cheap, you can usually get DACs uh, even cheaper. A DAC is basically what looks like the optical modules on each end, but with a copper cable in between. And it's just, they're less fragile than the fiber optic cables uh, and generally cheaper than having to buy two optics and a patch cable to just buy one DAC and plug a NIC directly into another NIC or a NIC into a switch. And for switches, the one I've been using is uh, Ubiquiti makes one called the Edge Switch XG16 or something like that. Uh, yeah, ES16 XT or something. Anyway, it's a 16 port uh, 10 gigabit switch. You get 12 SFP plus modules. So you can plug in the optical modules or DACs and four copper ethernet. So you can also do even 10 gigabit over regular ethernet, which I've found to work quite well. And it's about 650 bucks where most other 10 gigabit switches are into the thousands. There's also a Microtik. I've never tried it and I think it's only four ports. Uh, which isn't very many for a switch but if it's a small home lab it's i think sub 200 dollars and works quite nicely for getting you know just a couple of machines connected at 10 gigabit for a home lab okay yeah so that's a nice addition to your home lab or your very first if you are starting out so that's a good uh way to get it cheap but a powerful uh nick Next up, we have more for the historians among us, but nevertheless interesting if you're in the BSD space. Uh, Warner Lush has been in the search of 2.11 BSD as released. So uh, the 2.11 BSD original tapes uh, recreation project, I would say. So Warner writes, almost all of the BSD releases have been well preserved. If you want to find one BSD or two BSD or 4.3 Tahoe BSD, you can find them online with little fuss. However, if you search for 2.11 BSD or 2.11, you'll find it easily enough. Yeah, but it won't be the original. You'll find either the latest patched version, uh, patch level 469, or the one of the earlier popular versions, uh, patch level 430 is popular. Uh, you can even find the retro BSD project, which uses 2.11 BSD as a starting point to create systems for tiny MIPS-based PIC controllers. You'll find every single patch that's been issued for the system. What you will not find, however, is the original 2.11 BSD tapes, uh, the release ones. You won't find the original sources. With some digging, you can find the 2.11 BSD patch level 195. This was released about 30 months after the original was released and is the oldest one that's known to exist. The reason is that the original 2.11 BSD tapes were distributed by USNIX. They charged a large fee for the tapes, and so not too many people bought them. And uh, this was before Caldera released the ancient Unixes under a permissive license, so the bulk of the feed went to AT&T. Uh, its cost uh, made it a low-volume item. Well, understandable. Uh, plus, there were patches uh, all the time, so the master tapes were respun from time to time. The originals weren't preserved, alas, because storage was expensive, and by the early 1990s, the PDP-11s were a bit of a French machine, except in certain niches with long procurement times. But wait, you said we have all the patches. Patch-R is super easy to use, dash capital R, that is. Uh, use that to go backwards, right? Well... Yeah, so patch capital R takes a patch and unapplies it, basically reverses the patch. So if you have the patched file and the patch, you can use that to get back to the original version. Exactly, yeah. Go back in time, basically. Uh, well, no, Warner writes, con to continue, the patches aren't uh, all context diffs. Hmm. Instead, they include instructions like, remove these files, then extract this UU-encoded uh, compressed tarball, or other information destroying instructions. So uh, the information is lost, maybe for good. We can't get there. Or we can. If we look at it in a vacuum, it sure sounds hopeless. Information destroyed, you said. However, while it's true information is destroyed in many of the patches, it's only one copy that's destroyed. We have other sources of information. The 2.11 BSD release is part of a series of releases in the 2BSD family. So we have 2.10.1 BSD, the prior release, that's been preserved. We know from the release notes that significant influxes of code came from 4.3 BSD. There's also a Usenet news group called comp.box.2bsd that posted patches. Ah. 
uh, it's known that these patches wound up in 2.11 BSD. Also, all of the patches to 2.11 BSD were posted there by the original authors until Usenet went away. So the project here is uh, B Warner's uh, private, I guess, uh, but now public. Uh, this brings us up to 2.11 BSD patch level zero restoration project. The goal of the project is to create two main artifacts. First, it would be cool to have a Git repo that has all the 2.11 BSD patch points in it. Second, it would be really cool to have a new copy of the 2.11 BSD release tapes. This project aims to create these artifacts in a reproducible way. And when completed, anybody can take the existing artifacts. We have the scripts from the project, including all the hints needed to get the data from the other projects, as well as a few handcrafted patches, which produce results consistent uh, with all the info known about these. So the status of the project is that he's worked his way through the 195 patches, undoing them. Many of them are simple patches, packed in an annoying, eclectic number of different ways. Uh, some, however, destroy information and require research to untangle. I've done the best I can and have made it back to patch level zero sources. Almost. There's one or two lingering issues that need to be tracked down in relatively unimportant files. And he's created a script to create a tape to load into his 2.bsd11 uh, patch level 195 to build in a change root um, a 2.11 BSD patch level zero system. Oh, cool. Uh, there's a script that he's built that builds everything from the patch level zero level twice. Uh, there's noise in the release notes of at least some of these releases that were reproducibility issues. It's currently past the initial bootstrap phase and he can build all the libraries, but automation is needed. And he provides his uh, handle and information how you can get involved and of course the github project itself to link up and contribute to or provide some insights if you have them uh, the status is also there so updates will be following along either there or on warner's blog very cool yeah fill the gaps uh, in history and uh, that's that's very very nice i think that's important uh, later on when the historians look at these and have a full set of patches that you can go through All right, it's time for the news roundup this week. We found an article called Fake Cracker, NetBSD as a function-based micro-VM. That sounds cool by itself. Yeah, so this is uh, back in November of 2018, AWS published an open source tool called Firecracker, uh, mostly a virtual machine monitor relying on KVM. Basically a small size Linux kernel and a stripped down version of QMU. Uh, what baffled me was the speed at which the virtual machine would fire up and run the diff service. The whole process is in, uh, or the whole process is to be compared to a container, but safer, as it does not share the kernel or any resources. It is a separate and dedicated virtual machine. If you want to learn more about Firecracker, then there's some articles linked in there. See, I like the idea and thought NetBSD would be a perfect match for this kind of target, as the kernel and the entire OS can be stripped down easily. I know this because in 2016 I wrote a wannabe container project called Sailor, the goal of which is to create container type CH routes to run services kind of like Docker. I use this project for my own needs and uh, this very website that you're seeing right now is actually running on a Sailor ship. <laughs> I like that name. This is fun and all, but we can't really talk about security only with CH routes. Uh, the Firecracker solution seemed about right for this matter, yet the overall NetBSD boot process was a bit too long for my taste. So how exactly can we significantly improve the NetBSD boot speed? Well, there are two major ones or wins. One, you can reduce the number of kernel features. Uh, and two, you can bypass the bootloader. The first point is pretty easy to accomplish. So they have a very minimal kernel config here. They've optimized the kernel for size and uh, disabled a bunch of features and stripped it down to just the bare minimum. Note that we absolutely need the Vertio drivers as Vertio is the fastest way of handling devices in a virtualized environment. Now that uh, about the second point, uh, it's not quite as simple as it seems. The kernel must be able to load out of the blue, i.e. without the need for a bootloader. In NetBSD, this is possible on the i386 port thanks to the multi-boot kernel option. And unfortunately, as of today, uh, it was uh, June 18th of 2020, this option is not supported on AMD64. It looks like somebody might be working on it though. Uh, so the rest of this article will assume that you're going to boot i386, which is a bit frustrating yet not really a problem uh, since most of the packages are available for this platform as well. I won't be covering how to prepare the environment for cross-compiling tools and kernels, 
Instead, there's already a good tutorial on this subject. Note that you can cross compile the i386 NetBSD kernel on a 64 bit Linux system. Uh, that's actually what I do. Nevertheless, you will need uh, an i386 NetBSD machine, although it could be virtual, in order to create the root disk used for the services that we want to run. But TLDR, here's the command you need build.sh, uh, and you're saying you make me an i386 kernel uh, based on the config firecracker. And then they can just use KVM to run, feed that kernel directly into the image and run it with no graphics. Now about the real service uh, to get started. So in this case, we'll start the Nginx web server, which will start without the rc.d framework, given that will gain us precious milliseconds. To create a root file system, we'll use the sailor tool. Again, I will not cover sailor's usage in this particular tutorial. So I create a config file, and I name the ship fake cracker, set the path, the binaries that they want it to have and the packages they want it to have and have it spin up the devices. And now we create a custom RC file, which will be interpreted after the micro VM starts. Uh, basically init will call this file, a simple uh, shell script they have here, replacing RC with literally just configure the network and start the web server. And uh, they even have it do uh, a head request against the web server to make sure it's working. Ah, excellent. Uh, and they've say so they've uh, since learned about the MakeFS utility, which allows you to uh, make a disk image as a regular user instead of needing to do the whole VND config, newFS, mount, rsync, etc. So while their instructions cover doing it this longer way, uh, you might be able to just use the MakeFS utility. And so you can see them running KVM, they provide the kernel, and then add their LD0A device and point it at the root image and configure some networking. And then, voila, you have a, uh, a micro VM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting project. Yep. It seems like something you could do with FreeBSD as well. Like, the, it's, there's nothing here that's any OS is overly specific. Uh, it would just be, you know, stripping things down and uh, trying to make it load as fast as possible. I think, in particular, on FreeBSD, you could have the Bootstrap, uh, which is the little, you know, couple hundred kilo or less than a hundred kilobyte uh, boot code program, load the kernel directly instead of loading the loader. But that would mean you lose loader.conf, so you wouldn't be able to have it load like modules like ZFS and so on. Uh, so it might be slightly problematic. But if you were building something specific for this, you can just compile those modules directly into the kernel uh, and not need the loadable module part. Sure, yeah, that's, uh, it could also be used for testing and uh, CI work. Mm -hmm. huh? Okay, yeah, we'll keep you posted if there's more in this area. And next, we should uh, definitely mention to you that there's uh, news on undeadly.org. Uh, the first PowerPC snapshots are available for OpenBSD from, of course, the PowerPC 64 to the people department. Uh, since last time they reported, so that's a link uh, to another article on, on Deadly, uh, the first bits of PowerPC support going into the tree on May 16th, work has progressed at a steady pace, resulting in snapshots now being available for this platform. So if you have a Power9 system idling around, go to your nearest mirror, that's a separate link, and fetch this snapshot. Keep in mind that as this is still very early days, very little hand-holding is available you are basically on your own. Uh, Mark Ketanis uh, writes in some more details on supported systems. OpenBSD PowerPC64 is being developed on Raptor computing systems, Blackbird and Talos 2 systems, but is expected to run on all open power, non-virtualized Power 9 systems. Adding support for Power 8 system is planned, but access to such a system would be needed to make progress in that direction. It'd be interesting to get a status report on the Power 9 uh support in FreeBSD. I don't actually know where it is. I know a bunch of people were working on those uh, Blackbird and, and Taylor systems, but I don't know how well it's going so far. Yeah, maybe there's something in the quarterly status reports which we'll cover in another episode. Um, haven't looked at that too much, but yeah, it's it would be good to hear from them that there's uh, something new. Speaking of something new, uh, there's a new OpenSense release. 20.1.8 uh, has been released recently-ish. Uh, July 3rd, okay. Um, good day, everyone, they write. Sorry about the delay while we uh, chase the race condition in the updates back to an issue with the latest FreeBSD package manager updates. For now, we reverted to our current version, but all relevant third-party packages have been updated as updates became available over the last weeks. 
uh, like curl and Python, host APD, WPA supplicant, amongst others. Yeah, these are kind of important to have. Um, there's a couple patch notes. A couple of interesting things. They allow high availability sync of network time settings um, and added uh, fixed stateless DHCP v6 uh, for track six interfaces. Prevented gateway protocol mismatches from breaking rule sets and improved some of the alias help text. Uh, added DNS 64 support to unbound. Fixed the button label for downloading ACLs for the web proxy. Updated plugins for Acme client, uh, DNS script proxy, Dyn DNS, AJ proxy, uh, free radius, and a bunch of other things. Updated the ports, uh, the SSL certificate bundle, curl. Uh, and like we mentioned, host APD and, and the like, uh, and updated Perl, PHP, Python, SQLite, sudo, etc. Yeah, a bunch of updates, new, fresh stuff. You should definitely update your OpenSense. Yep, yeah, and our next one is on old school disk partitioning. Uh, again, uh, from our kind of old school expert, uh, Warner Lodge. Uh, Unix started out life in 1970. Many of the things it did it had to invent on the fly. Disk handling was one of these things. Something we take utterly for granted today was once upon a time an area of active innovation. This blog will explore the early days of Unix when we had static partitioning compiled into the driver. It was easy when there was only two models of disks that could be in your machine. So typical drives of the era were large and difficult to manage. And when he means large, he means physically large. And there's an accompanying picture of what you know a disk that looks bigger than my whole computer for example an rl01 or rl02 uh, by the looks of the image and had maybe five or ten megabytes of storage unix from the early days had at least two types of data that were stored on disk the first type was a file system which offered you know a hierarchical namespace the second was swap unix was a swapping system from the earliest days and to multiplex jobs into and out of memory. The kernel would keep track of what blocks were assigned to which processes. Since the disk played two different roles uh, with different allocation policies and persistent storage, to keep these things simple, in the first edition, the disk was partitioned in a static way. The file system used its part of the disk and swap used a separate part. Uh, DEC never produced a partitioning standard, though later it used Unix's for its Unix related products. This means that the Unix guy had nothing to draw from and so failed to produce a standard before Unix ended up leaving the research group and, and spreading. So in first through third editions, there was almost nothing resembling partitioning in these early editions of the kernel. Unix booted from the drum device uh, using the top 64 blocks to store itself. The rest of the disk was reserved for swapping processes into and out of the core memory. The source refers to this as the drum, and there were 1,024 256 byte blocks in the drum. So that's 256 kilobytes of usable space. The disks were presented as a device node, uh, which was the entire disk. From the third edition manual page, it says, RK question mark refers to the entire RK03 disk as a single sequentially addressed file. Its 256 word blocks are numbered zero, through 4,871. Like the RF disk and tape drives, its address uh, addressing is block oriented, uh, which describes a single file that has its entire block storage available. The third edition had an enigmatic slash CRP file system documented for one of the drives. <laughs> he says, I wonder what that's an abbreviation for. So RK0 was the root file system. RK1 was the USR file system. Uh, RK2 was slash sys and RK3 was slash CRP, which also shows that you had one file system per disk. At 1.2 megabytes, these drives were much bigger than a floppy disk. Or sorry, at 1.2 megabytes, these drives are little bigger than a floppy disk. So having just one file system per drive was not much of a limitation. Also note that the sector size was 256 words, which is 512 bytes, which is still something we're dealing with today. Uh, since we have limited sources uh, from this time period, it's hard to say for sure. But the bulk of the surviving data, though, says at most the last 64 blocks were reserved for Unix itself. Then we come up to fourth edition. With the fourth edition, we start to see multiple files that refer to different sections on the same disk. This was done because the new RP03 drives supported a whopping 
81,200 blocks, which exceeded the limit of the time of 65,536 blocks per device. It also allowed the drive to be broken up into more manageable chunks. Because that much space, you couldn't ever use that all in one file system. Yeah, yeah, easily. Most of us have files bigger than that nowadays. But anyway, this allows the drive to be broken up into these manageable chunks. In this release, there were eight uh, files in slash dev directory named RP0 through RP7. For a second drive uh, connected, you get RP8 through RP15, and so on. Uh, the manual has a table which mirrors the surviving code. So uh, RP0 was the first, basically half of the drive, almost uh, 40,600 block. So the beginning to that offset. And then disk uh, RP1 would be that offset for another 40,600 blocks. Then RP2 would cover 0 through 3,200, which appears to overlap. And then 3 was 3,200 to 39,000. And then 4 was 42,200, uh, which is basically after 2 and 3, and went to that 3900. This basically allows two configurations for the drive. You can A, split it in half, or using RP0 and RP1, or you can R use RP2, 3, and 4 to make a small root partition and then split the remaining space. And then he asks, but where's the partition for swap? There isn't one. Uh, swap space in the fourth edition was configured by hard-coded defines in the source code in param.h. You define the device, the start and length of that device to use. The system would then configure that during early boot. The downside, though, of defines was one couldn't easily do a binary patch. Swap was put in between the used parts of other disks. This was tricky to get right since you had to map out the whole system. You'd think that all the drives were like this, but that's not the case. The RF driver uh, specified the size of the drive itself with different minor uh, device node. The RK de device allowed one to experiment with different uh, interleaf factors with different minor numbers. It really was up to the drive itself to decide how to interpret those minor numbers. Uh, this isn't unusual. Uh, you know, the various magnetic tape drivers use minor numbers to specify density and whether or not to rewind when you close the tape and so on. But then we get to 5th and 6th edition. The 5th edition continued to evolve. It changed the table above and there's a number of overlapping regions that need special care to be used. It also meant that you'd have to reinstall the system or hack the tables in the driver when you did an upgrade. You know, if you had uh, one of the older versions that used a different setup. Uh, there was only about seven months between the fourth and fifth editions, so I suspect the problem was not that common. When fourth edition came out, there were 20 computers running it, or 20 sites, but each site probably only had one computer. Uh, by the fifth edition, that was up to 50. So the number wasn't huge, but at the time, that was a big number. Since the kernel was patchable using ABD or the front panel switches, these issues likely could be uh, mitigated and not be able to rebuild. Folks running 4th edition uh, were trailblazers by definition, so could be expected to cope with any upgrades when they were going to the 5th edition. By the time the 6th edition came out, it was in the hundreds or thousands of machines, which explains why it remained constant between the 5th and 6th edition. And it has a, a table showing the offsets, where mostly they just made the uh, the root partition a bit bigger uh, since Unix was growing. And it looks like they made a second copy, a second small partition at the end of the drive, and then gave you uh, kind of the middle of the drive as a, a big chunk. But swapping was still handled by using the space between these partitions. So there's a bunch of unused space, and you just write to the those offsets on the disk. So that's not great. What was interesting is that the fifth edition introduced the raw character devices as well as block devices used for file system. The sixth edition uses the same table as the fifth edition. It also introduced other disk interfaces with similar hard-coded partitions for each different type of disk. And then the seventh edition changed the layout again. Uh, it wasn't just to be mean, but because DEC had introduced newer, larger drives and also allowed uh, larger partitions. So now disks could be addressed using three bytes instead of two, so you no longer had that limit of 65,000 blocks per device. Uh, and some drivers now supported multiple drives, so the partitions are fixed, but set up so that different layouts on the devices are supported, as well as supporting different models. For example, the HP driver supports both the RP04 and RP05 and the RP06 drives, uh, which are twice as large as the previous drive, and so on. And then we get into 2BSD through 2.11BSD. Uh, the 7th edition 
ended up becoming 2BSD, which began a series of releases for the PDP-11, starting amusingly through the last PDP-11 release, 2.8 BSD. By the time we get to 2.11 BSD, we have a system that has about 50 different types of disk and partitioning schemes that are increasingly difficult to manage. Each one is a special little snowflake depending on what kind of drive you actually have attached. The table in the XP driver is 75 lines long, which the author knew is bad because they prefix the whole table with this should be read off the disk pack per drive, not hard-coded in the kernel. So then we get 4BSD, which had a similar problem. They made it more palatable by creating a program called disk part, which displayed the default disk partition for a specific drive type or allowed one to create partition tables to cut and paste into a driver or config file. This helped, but was still compiled into the kernel rather than being stored on the disks. 4.1 BSD in 1981 added a new wrinkle. The bad sector information and replacement sectors are conveniently only accessible through the H file system partition on a disk. If that partition is used for a file system, the user is responsible for making sure that it doesn't overlap the bad sector information or any uh, of the replacement sectors, which was an improvement, but still a small step. Through the rest uh, up to 4.3 BSD, um, this was the case. Every driver had its own table that had to be hand tweaked for the specific drives and drivers that you're using. This was okay as far as it went, but as the industry shifted away from the controller and disk combos, uh, where there was only a few choices and a standard interface, uh, it was going to get to be an untenable situation. We'll explore how it got worse before it got better in the second part of this article, which will come out later. We'll see how different vendors innovated in this area ahead of a solution that appeared in 4.3 BSD Tahoe and in the AT&T System 5 release 3 around the same time. So yeah, back then, partition tables were basically part of the driver for the disk and not actually written to the disk anywhere. But you know, nobody pulled the disk out of their system and tried to plug it in a different system and expect it to work either, so. Yeah, so that's that was a different time, different disk sizes. I mean, size and form factors. <laughs> But yeah, it's the early Unix days, so what do you expect? And everything else built from that. Uh, speaking a bit more modern BSDs, a new release of Nomad BSD is out, a 1.3.2 release. So Nomad BSD, for the people who haven't heard about it, is a persistent live system for USB flash drives based on FreeBSD. And it does automatic hardware detection and setup. And so you can use it, for example, if you buy a new computer and you just take it on a USB stick, plug it into the new machine in the... Uh, in the shop, for example, if they let you, and then you can check whether everything works. And so uh, here's what has changed since version 1.31. The base system has been upgraded to the latest 12.1 patch level 6 of FreeBSD. Then they added an RTS XK mod, which is a driver for Realtek card readers. And the ZFS layout used for installing Nomad BSD on a hard disk, so it doesn't always have to live as a live disk. You can also install it. Uh, that has been changed to allow BEACTL. Wait, that 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 should be BCTL. Yeah. Yeah. To back up the boot environment. So that is also uh, possible. Is, that's a typo. Just BECTL. They added uh, Intel uh, backlight graphics uh, port as well. So you can change the backlight and test that in the, sh in the store before you buy. Uh, curses menu has been added. So the can acknowledge any license of certain wireless drivers in order to use them because you also want to check out wireless uh, working in the shop before you hand over money. And uh, Graphics Mirage has been replaced by Graphics View Newar. Uh, other than that, oh, there's a brightness listener, uh, a tool that listens to the back uh, in the background on DevD events for key presses of screen brightness buttons and shows the current brightness level using Dunst. Yeah, so... Uh... They brought in a patch for the ACPI video module so that it'll trigger a DevD event whenever you change the brightness. And then they added the brightness listener tool so you actually see an on-screen display showing you know, your brightness is at this percentage. Oh, that's nice. Uh, which is, uh, yeah, that's one of those kind of little quality of life things that's, that's missing by default in FreeBSD and the kind of thing that this kind of distro is very useful for. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing is along the lines uh, called volume control. It's a wrapper around S, uh, user has been mixer to increase, decrease, and toggle the mute of the sound card and display the current value with Dunst, like uh, as Alan mentioned, the brightness. Yeah. Just like the brightness. You know, it's very handy when you're 
changing the volume to be able to see what the volume yeah. currently is. That that kind of gives you a visual feedback so that you know you actually decreased or increased it. Uh, bug was fixed, uh, which makes the brightness keys of the ThinkPad T450 fail, has been fixed, and a bunch of updates as well. So always good to get the latest version. And they have a forum for people who can uh, ask questions or comment on how they like it. And they also do a folding at home team. So all good reasons to run Nomad BSD or have it in your pocket if you buy a new yeah, it's machine. It's very handy to have a, uh, a nice uh, live system like this that works well. Exactly. And now we have something interesting called Chi Fi. Uh, wh what is Chi Fi, you may ask? Well, Chi Fi is a tool to make adding public Wi Fi networks to wpasupplicant.conf easier. So it's basically a small install script. You install Go and then pull down the Chi Fi shell script. Is it shell? Yeah. No, it's Go. Oh, Go. Okay, right. Of course. Because otherwise, why would you need? go <laughs> to have it go installed first uh, after building that you get a nice little um, oh here's a screenshot okay so you get uh, all the ssids around you and you can pick up the ones that you want to connect to like the, the coffee shop down the street hopefully that's open uh, again and then you uh, enter a password and then it would create in the background your etc wpa supplicant conf entry for exactly that. And so next time you come back to the store and buy your triple mocha latte, whatever, with extra sugar on top, um, then you can reconnect to this because you now have an entry to WPA supplicant. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's a nice uh, w a way of making your life a little bit easier, especially if you're roaming around a lot with your Wi-Fi and networks changing all the time. All right. So, by the way, you move around a lot, you might lose your laptop and you lose all the files with it. What could be better than having a secure backup solution to pull down your disks or your drives or your files folders? Data. Yep. Uh, on a new laptop that you had to buy because the old one was lost or stolen. And yeah, too bad. But luckily you had backups to the latest files that you had on your disk. Yes. So head over to tarsnap.com slash BSD now uh, and get set up with Tarsnap. What's really nice about Tarsnap is because it does the deduplication and compression on your machine before it sends the backup, it means that incremental backups are as small as they can possibly be. So it means you can do your backups on the road. Even if you only have a few minutes on the Wi-Fi at the, the coffee shop that you configured with Chi-Fi, you can still back up that code you've been working on today because you know, you're you only backing up the blocks of data that actually changed. the uh, the deduplication and, and, and difference finding algorithm in Tarsnap is really interesting. Like if you want, you can go read Colin's papers on how he came up with it and so on. It's really, really well done. But yes, uh, Tarsnap is easy. You sign up, you put some money in the account and you start backing things up. You just pay for the, the gigabytes of transfer and the gigabytes of storage that you use. Uh, and it comes out of that balance that you deposited. So it means there's never a surprise bill because you pay for everything up front. So you can start with as little as just putting $5 in your account and start creating backups. You'll sleep better at night and it's definitely worth the price of that fancy <laughs> tea you were going to have. Oh yes, for sure. And then someone knocks and brings your laptop back because they found it, uh, but you just happy because you have backups. Anyway, <laughs> that's the that happy ending to that sad story. Even, parano even paranoids need backups. Uh, and if you're not paranoid, you should. Oh, yes. Yeah. Especially uh, if it comes to your data and the files that you want to. I'm not that paranoid about security, but I am paranoid about my data. So I make sure it's back. Oh, yeah. And no one else can see it. You know, I'm sure all of us have a story of some data we lost that we really, really wish we hadn't lost. Uh, well, don't repeat that same mistake. Get your backup going. Yep. Securely, safely and cheap. So, time for the feedback and questions section of this episode. Uh, we get feedback, of course, and you can send this to us at feedback at bsdnow.tv and then we'll uh, magically appear in a future episode. Uh, Poojan is the first one with a ZFS question. Uh, goes like the following. I have what seems to be a contradicting 
or a contradiction about available space in my ZFS file system or pool. Basically, the ZFS and zpool commands don't agree. I'm hoping you can clear my confusion. For your listeners, this is easier to read this description. Yeah, um, I have six units of eight terabyte magnetic drives arranged in uh, two times the RAID Z1 configuration. That is, my VDEVs are RAID Z1-0 and RAID Z1-1, which with each VDEV consisting of three magnetic drives, eight terabyte each drive. A uh, zpool status output is provided, um, but it's difficult to read, so it's just an overview for us. And a zpool list follows as well. This shows 3.12 terabytes free. Since I added the second set of 8 terabyte drives later, this pool is not balanced. Hmm. There are 444 gigs free on the first VDEV, but 2.69 terabyte free on the second VDEV. Uh, here's a zpool list verbose output. Okay. What confuses me though is that I would expect to see something like 2 terabytes free in ZFS. Uh, three terabyte of raw space available, but reduced to two terabyte due to rates at one parity. However, I only see five ten gigs available. Ah, yes. Uh, I'm not sure if it matters, but I recently removed some old TV shows from my Plex DVR. Okay, and then destroyed the snapshots. Okay, I'm a big bit confused because the five ten gigs does not make sense. It is not much as I expected, two thirds of the sum of the individual VDEV's disk space, but it's also more than four hundred forty four gigs of the individual VDEV, and provide some extra parameters, but I guess we can help without them. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing is, yes, ZFS and zpool will almost never agree, except for in a, a one disk system. Uh, and even there, not exactly. So yeah, when you do zpool list, it's going to tell you about the pool, which in this case is the raw available space. So something that confuses a lot of people is RAID Z is dynamic parity. So it doesn't know the layout of how much parity you're actually going to use before you use it, uh, because it depends on the size of your blocks. For example, in your RAID Z1 configuration here, if each of those drives has a four kilobyte sector size, and you try to write one four kilobyte block, it's going to take two blocks, right? One for the data and one for the parity. But if you write two blocks, it's actually going to take four because while it would only normally take three, right? The two plus one, that's then not divisible by the parity level one plus one, which is two. So it has to be rounded up to four so that you don't end up with a single sector left over somewhere that would never be usable. So the number you're expecting there is with the three or all the eight terabyte drives is that the total size will actually be the sum of all of the, so zpool list, the total size will be the sum of all of the disks without any of the parity considered. Then as you write to it, you'll find that when you write a gigabyte of data, it will, the allocated number there will go up by more than a gigabyte. <laughs> yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so when you write a gigabyte of data to the file system, it will actually occupy more than a gigabyte of space when you do zpool list because it'll be that gigabyte of space plus all the parity and padding and metadata and other stuff. And so basically you just don't even want to look at zpool list as far as knowing how much space you have, because in the end, you know, trying to do all the RAID Z math in your head is hard. And it's, there's no like one formula that will do it because you basically have to add up the usage of every block, which is going to be, you know, there's millions of them. So, Yes, uh, the zpool list one will, just because there's 3.12 terabytes free doesn't mean you can write three terabytes of data to the pool because you actually need to deflate that by, you know, the RAID Z usage factor, which is different depending on the sector size and the record size and the amount of metadata and a bunch of other things. So ZFS list shows you this other number, which has already taken into account the worst possible case for your RAID Z parity for the metadata and for a bunch of other things. Because one of the other things that is in there is there's what ZFS calls slop space. Because ZFS is copy on write, if it ever got completely full, you would be in a very bad situation because you need to, before you can erase a block, you need to make a copy of the block that refers to that one and say that's not there anymore, right? You have to update the metadata to delete things. So you need space. So by default, ZFS reserves, I think the default, shift is five. So ZFS reserves two to the power of five, or sorry, one, two to the power of five is 
So 1 32nd, right? So 2 to the power of 5 is 32. So 1 32nd of all of your space is reserved by Z of S to make sure it's going to have enough room for you to un to delete stuff when you accidentally fill the pool. Uh, so, you know, if you have 43.2 terabytes, 1 32nd of that is 1.35 terabytes. So, you know, there's that part. So you have your, your 3.12 terabytes of free space, but we're going to have 1.35 terabytes of that as reserved. So now we only have 1.77 terabytes usable, but you also have to leave room for the metadata and for your RAID Z parity and padding uh, and so on. So the number you see in ZFS list is the one that's actually going to make sense. The other thing that can happen there is you might actually find that when you write a bunch of data, the free space doesn't go down by as much as you thought it would. For example, if you write with a larger record size, uh, like the one megabyte record size instead of the default 128K, that results in less metadata and it means uh, the bigger chunks means you might end up with less padding. So if you write terabytes of data with this larger uh, record size, you might find that the available free space doesn't go down quite as much because the free or the available number that ZFS list gives assumes that every write after this is going to be the worst possible case. You're going to take the most amount of space that it could possibly take. Whereas when you actually write it and it turns out not to be the worst possible case, it will reduce the space by only the correct amount, meaning that you won't necessarily run out quite as fast as you think, but you know, you're, you're only talking about a couple of gigabytes of, of wiggle room here, so it's not going to save you that much. Okay. Yeah, that pretty much uh, answers. <laughs> so yes, uh, the zpool list one is the raw physical space. So it's ZFS's understanding of every single sector and whether it's got data in it or not, which is not just because the sector doesn't have data in it doesn't mean you can fill it with data. ZFS is going to need room uh, to write the metadata and the parity and the padding and all that. And ZFS is also reserving some of the space to make sure that uh, you don't run yourself completely out of space. Uh, so it does look like what you need is some more space because yeah, your pool's past 92% full. So it's, and the other thing you can see is when you did your uh, zpool list dash V, the first VDEV that is 97% full, you can see the fragmentation level is 49%. That means 49% of the free space is made up of the smallest size blocks. So 49% of the 444 gigs of available space is made up of 4K blocks, meaning that when you try to use them, ZFS is going to have to, you know, if you try to write 128K and all you have is a bunch of spread out 4K chunks, ZFS is going to have to do what are called gang blocks, where it takes a bunch of those spread out chunks and strings them together to make a 128K chunk. But that means you need to use more space uh, to write down the list of, oh, if you want to find this chunk, it's spread over all over here. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to end up taking more metadata. And so as you get closer to full, uh, the available space will be worse and worse. I don't recommend it, but there there is a sysctl that controls the slop space. It's called uh, spa slop shift. So that's two to the power of that number, uh, or one over two to the power of that number is how much the pool is reserved. And the default is five, which is one thirty second. So if you change it to six, that'll be one sixty fourth. So you would, you know, suddenly when you do zfs list you will see slightly higher amount of space available because your reserved bit would be like 680 gigs instead of 1.3 uh, terabytes or whatever. And so, you know, that would give you back a couple hundred uh, gigabytes of more space, but at the cost of hurting things even more when you get closer to 100% full. And since you're already past 92, mm. the only times I've really done this is when creating pools that are hundreds of terabytes or even petabytes, where, you know, reserving 12 terabytes doesn't make sense. Uh, there's some talk upstream about changing this value to have a maximum where, you know, we don't ever need to save more than, you know, 128 gigabytes. So using 132nd of the pool, as a starting point made sense, but we might need an upper limit. There's already a lower limit for very small pools, but we might need an upper limit to say, you know, it's never going to take 
more than 256 gigabytes of slop, even if the pool is, is petabytes. And that might help, you know, you get that pool a little bit fuller, but you really don't want to be operating your ZFS at full because like we said, ZFS, when it gets past 90% full, has to switch to, instead of finding the first place where there's enough room to write your data, it looks for the best place. Because, you know, if half of all the space is made up of tiny chunks, you don't want it to find the first space. You want to find the one that's closest to the size of your thing, right? If you're writing 32K, you don't want it to break up a nice eight megabyte chunk of free space that you could use for the next write that is a megabyte. But yeah, so performance will go down as your fullness goes up. So you might want to try cleaning up, but you can eke out a little bit more by changing that tunable, but I don't recommend it because you're just, you know, living on borrowed time as it is. But anyway, yes, uh, lots of people get confused by the fact that zpool list says one amount and zfs list says another. Just ignore the zpool one. It's basically the space before any of the zfs stuff, the metadata, the parity, the padding, uh, the reservations, etc. And yeah, no useful, no user serviceable parts there. Uh, just worry about what ZFS list says. So that was kind of a long answer, but yes, uh, definitely worthwhile knowing about the backgrounds and all the extra stuff going behind the scenes. Uh, should we take another one or? Uh, yeah, we might as well get through them. Okay. Uh, next one is Gracion uh, about a super micro. Goes like this. Hi all, the show is greatly appreciated. Long live BSD now. Love the show. Thank you. I, I see myself maybe in like episode... 4,367 being like, well, we now, episode something. But uh, yeah, if I do it that long, then I'm certainly uh, <laughs> old enough to do it. Okay, as a listener to the BSD Now program... I don't think... The, for Episode 4,300 would be like 80 years into... Yeah, well... Do, do you plan to live for 75 more years from machines? now? <laughs> <laughs> well, in that regard, I'm like Riker. I plan to live forever. Um... <laughs> Moving on. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, as a listener to the BSD Now program for some time and having heard the many requests for questions, well, here goes. Excellent. In the process of cleaning our storage at work, I came across a Supermicro motherboard uh, X11 SSH CTF0 slated for disposal. Suffice it to say, I could not bring myself to trash it. Instead, decided to save it and somehow set up a dedicated BSD or TrueOS lab. <laughs> Perfect hardware for that. Uh, this could serve as my BSD TrueOS Media Lab with Ravenna AES67 IP network audio hardware in conjunction with Blackmagic hardware and software. Not to overlook uh, ZCam. Well, it turns out... Yeah, like an, an X11 SSH motherboard is is quite modern. Oh yeah, it's a decent machine. Yeah. That's, that's actually pretty close to the hardware in the machine I'm sitting at right now. It's an X11 SSL? I forget. But anyway. Okay, so, but it turns out it was a good decision. Uh, as quick uh, visit to the Supermicro showed the board uh, to be well provisioned, needing only a CPU, memory, and a case, which I have. So, though the machine is close to three years old, it could function nicely as a media workstation and new or near line storage server. Yep. My questions are how well would this uh, motherboard function in the applications described above? I don't know much about. The applications you were describing, like the black magic stuff, I don't do that much kind of media production and audio stuff. Mm. Uh, yeah, as for the workstation, will be used to capture, edit, and convert both high resolution audio and video media files, which CPU will serve best for these applications. Um, so it supports Intel 6th and 7th generation CPUs, like the core, you know, i3, Pentium, uh, etc., or a Xeon E3 1200v6. So anything in the Intel socket H4, uh, 1152, and supports up to 64 gigs of RAM. So I'm guessing the E3 is probably the, the top end there and supports ECC memory, if, which is the reason why it doesn't support like an i7. And in general, it's about the same price for the CPU that supports ECC uh, as the i3 version. So, you know, this is probably still going to top out at four cores and, and maybe eight threads, but uh, still a pretty good machine. Plus it has dual onboard 10 gigabit LAN and uh, lots of SATA ports. It looks like eight SATA via the motherboard and then eight more SAS via uh, an LSI 3008 controller. 
So yes, this would make a really nice NAS. Uh, then the question is, are there any plans or is anyone working on making BSD IP audio friendly, handling AES67, Ravenna or LifeWire IP network audio? Uh, this would be quite useful in BSD or TrueOS, giving it a distinct advantage in many ways. As I'm not a programmer, how can one contribute to make BSD network audio friendly and where does one start? I don't know anything about that. Um, sorry, can't really help you there. I know Hans, Hans Peter Seleski is kind of an audio nut and does a bunch of the audio stuff on FreeBSD, like, uh, and webcam D and so on, but he does like virtual audio something and, uh, some like MIDI stuff and music in general. He likes making music on FreeBSD. Uh, he might be the best person to talk to. Yeah. Um, maybe he can figure something out or make some, uh, code changes to make this appear in the tree. Yeah, the rest of the message is basically some of the audio setup and uh, what the advantages this just would bring. So yeah, if someone's out there listening to this and has a bit of audio experience as well as programming, then definitely get in touch or you get in touch with um, Hans-Peter Zelaski and maybe he can tell you if there's someone working or if he has made some uh, uh, work in that area. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So definitely thanks for this question. And uh, last but not least is Zenbum uh, with a question about Gruff. No, not the typesetting system. Um, goes like this. I've never been to a BSD conference, but I watch a lot of presentations on YouTube. After a while, I began to notice a stuffed goat. It's taken a surprising amount of Googling to piece together a partial biography of Gruff. Was Sean Webb's tweet at BSD Can 2014 the origin? Yes, it was. Uh, is Gruff the BSD goat still a thing? Oh, yes, for sure. At the moment, it's not traveling much. It's sitting um, home with me in a nice little place in my shelf. Um, but I can definitely tell you it's feeling fine. It's eating a couple of old bills that I haven't paid yet. But other than that, it's a very fine and nice goat. Um, and I hope that the next BSD conference is happening again soonish. And I will be happy to bring the goat to the next conference so that people can take pictures and make selfies and the usual funny things yeah um the fact that it started in 2014 reminds me just how far behind i am on my original goal of creating a website explaining the history of Groff. you know we have Groff to bsdgoat.com but right now it just redirects to the goat's twitter page because we never got around to making a history because i'd love to have a history and a map showing the path Groff has traveled because it's a a winding one he's been all over the place <laughs> yeah. I think Groff has not yet made it to Africa, but he has been to South America. Um, and I think we even know some people that at some point could arrange for Groff to go to uh, Antarctica, but that would necessitate <laughs> Groff not going anywhere else for a while, mm. uh, since you don't <laughs> tend to make short trips to Antarctica. Um, <laughs> but I think he's been to every other continent and more countries than I have, I think. So yeah, Groff started out as a, a, a tweet from Sean Webb, uh, which then, you know, Michael Lucas kind of expanded on it. And then I was teasing another podcaster who happens to have pet goats about it. <laughs> and it got off the rails. And eventually it resulted in uh, me being asked to bring a goat to BSD Can. Because I live in Canada, I wouldn't have to try to get it through customs like other people who are visiting from foreign countries. I looked into seeing if you could actually, you know, rent or borrow someone's actual goat and bring it to the pub on the night before BSD can. But A, that was going to be difficult. B, I didn't want to be responsible for it. And C, I didn't think the Royal Oak pub would very much appreciate us bringing a live goat in. And I don't know what the rules are with like health codes and so on. <laughs> So then I did the next best thing was looked on Amazon and found this stuffed goat that I could buy. I would have to pay more than the goat was worth in shipping in order to get it in time to have it to take it to VSD can. But I did and I brought it to VSD can. And the idea was everybody at the pub would get their picture taken with it. And at the end of the conference, we would auction it off and somebody would take it home and that would be the end of it. Ha ha. Very funny. But the goat was so popular during the conference that we decided it would make more sense Groff would go to the next conference. And so instead we auctioned off the naming rights and after vetoing Goatsy as the name, uh, we landed on Groff the BSD goat. And 
we gave the goat to Benedict to take to the next conference, which was in Europe. And Benedict uh, posted a couple of funny pictures uh, from the goat's perspective, including the goat, you know, tucked into bed in the dorms and the, the goat eating an apple and the, the goat having a shower. Oh, yeah. And that spawned the goat having a personality in a Twitter account. And it kind of went from there. And then, yes, basically at the end of each conference, we find some willing victim to take Groff to the next conference. And he kind of travels from conference to conference that way, often making detours to non-BSD stuff. Like uh, Peter Hessler made sure Groff went to a couple of ripe meetings uh, and a bunch of other interesting things. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the goat still tweets occasionally, so if you send it a little message, then it's happily replying or retweeting interesting stuff it finds. Uh, totally out of my control, but yeah, uh, that's the way how you can uh, keep the latest updates, what the goat is doing or not doing. Are you eating another bill? But yes, uh, the goal is to actually make the groffthebsdgoat.com website have a written history possibly with uh, people adding their own stories about uh, Graf and uh, a map showing all the different places Graf has been. Um, but I've never found the time to go and create that. Yeah, it would uh, require a bit of uh, research and uh, digging through the archives of, of Twitter. And... Well, that'll be easier sooner rather than later. So I'm gonna, I, I would like to get that written down at least, a list of locations and the order and so on. But, uh, you know, creating the website out of it is, again, it's something I could easily hand off to somebody if they were interested, but I would still be required to come up with the list of all the places Graf has been. <laughs> but we can do the best we can do uh, to start. And then, you know, as we get in touch with people who have had Graf before and the dates, we can maybe improve it. Yep. And that's the story of Graf. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for this question. And that pretty much wraps up our episode uh, for this week. Thank you for listening, providing your feedback, and hopefully... If you uh, like this episode, you can uh, give us a like on Twitter because when we post the episodes there, we usually get good feedback. And uh, definitely look out for our new episode next week. 